to The Tenderness Revolution, a podcast about the stories of kindness, compassion and empathy that play out in our lives, because these deeply moving experiences describe what it means to be human and invite us into a new way of thinking about the world and each other. I'm your host, writer and journalist Yvonne Gavin. And every episode, I'll be asking a new interviewee about a pivotal moment of tenderness that helped shape the course of their life. I'm here today for the last episode of season one with the artist Barney Steele whose visual imagination has taken him from directing music videos for bands such as Depeche Mode to exhibiting immersive experiences at the Sundance Film Festival and London's Saatchi Gallery. His amazing artwork as part of the design studio Marshmallow Laser Feast uses science as a springboard to explore the mystery of life. By creating immersive installations that combine virtual reality headsets with scents and soundscapes, you're invited to feel what it's like to be a dragonfly flying close to the forest floor, or an owl winging high through the wooded canopy, or even an ancient sequoia tree imbibing carbon dioxide. There is so much tenderness in Barney's artworks, which produce an intense experience of aliveness and deep connection with the natural world. His hope is that by encouraging us to see ourselves as part of a global system, we can shift from consumerism to conservation. Barney currently works in South East London, where he lives with his partner Sandra and their son, Elio. Hi, Barney. Thank you so much hey. for being on the podcast today. I'm really looking forward oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, it's so great to see you. It's really Yeah, likewise. Yeah. It's such a such a um it's it's great to uh I love what you're doing here and um yeah, I'm just excited to be to be part of this journey. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm really um I'm really chuffed that you're you know, you're having this conversation with me today because I've known you for for a while. Uh couple of decades probably now and um no it's just been following your work and obviously you know we're connected through family but I'm just so interested in in what you do and how your work has evolved it's it's just it's so so interesting and I think lots of people who listen to this are going to get a lot from it so so I, I I just wanted to start off as I always do by asking you to share your moment of tenderness with us because the idea behind the Tenderness Revolution podcast is that essentially our lives are made up of all these little stories stitched together. And when we shine a light on scenes where we felt a profound sense of connection to something bigger than ourselves, moments where we felt seen or understood or that we had a deeper relationship to the world around us, it's as though we're awakened to a greater sense of meaning and purpose. So please do share your moment with us, Barney. So um, I think I've, I've sort of had a number of moments on, uh, on my path through life, but uh, one of the most significant ones was uh, when I was younger. So my dad, my dad was the art teacher at school, and um, which, which was convenient because art was the subject that I was good at. I had all my confidence in art because I was pretty dyslexic and not in great sets for English or language, but this, this art thing was something I could really grab hold of. And, um, and so, you know, part of that um, journey for me was doing these um, sort of pencil illustrations and, um, you know, dad would sort of you present me with a, a, a lemon and, and sort of, you know, question of sort of, do you draw the, the dimples or the lemon? If you, if you draw the dimples, then the lemon emerges, but each dimple is shaded slightly differently. So I, I kind of got into this um, practice where I was really focusing on, on the subject and, and observing to uh, sort of the nth degree. And one of the uh, highlights of it was a, a pine cone, actually, where I'd spent maybe three weeks analyzing the structure of the pine cone and, and drawing all, all of the details. Um, so I think there was, that could be seen almost like a meditation in the, the, the process is becomes so focused. And there's also this relationship between um, sort of fear of 
ruining the artwork can restrict like the movement of your hand. So in order to, to really, for the artwork to be the best possible expression, you have to risk destroying it, which is a really interesting process. You know, the more, the more you start to care about it, the, uh, the tighter the hand gets and it becomes harder to achieve the sort of fluid strokes that, that in the end sort of create the power within the artwork. So I was really into this process and, and I was about 10 or 11. Um, and I had a, a um, you know, my family are Christians and been brought up as a Christian. I do a sort of prayer before bed. So I'd done my drawings and I got into bed and I had a moment where um, I basically got like electrocuted by pure joy, like pure joy and, and love. And it was completely overwhelming. Um, I was sort of, st I stood up on the bed and bounced up, bounced up and down, singing and dancing. I mean, the only way to describe it would be complete loss of control of all my emotions. I was crying and singing and dancing uh, with this energy passing through me. It's like being electrocuted by, by love. And, and then, so this, this was something that I didn't have a, you, you know, it was quite overwhelming and it stayed with me as a connection to something you know, what is this sort of this source or this essence of, of love and why love? And, 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 and it's been something that's been like a sort of compass um, for me through my life and the feeling of being connected to something much greater than myself. Um, and I think also the, yeah, the, it gives you, a, it gave me, it gave me a deep curiosity to, you know, what was that? And, as time went on and sort of the internet became a thing, you know, I started looking into that sensation. And, you know, if you type in um, like overwhelming sense of love, like exploding through my, through my body, like sort of um, like, like a bolt of lightning, you, you get Kundalini experiences in, in yoga. And, um, and actually a lot of meditation traditions talk about this as a, as a kind of sensation that it's a phenomenon that occurs. And so it started to give me this sense, a little bit like a satellite view of um, storms from space. You realize that a bolt of lightning from the ground, you know, you see that individual fork. But when you get the satellite view, you see these lightning bolts happening all over the planet. There's like thousands, there's thousands of lightning bolts in any given moment on a planetary scale. And so I started to think about that maybe these kind of deeper connections to love and sort of spiritual experiences are a phenomenon that exists across all religions and cultures. It's a, it's part of being a human and part of the connection to the, the, the deep mystery, I guess. So oh, that was a big moment for me. That's, that is just so beautiful. And also I'm really, really interested in, a couple of things I'm interested in what you think might have triggered it and also I'm I didn't know this about you so I'm really interested in maybe that you know that energy and that that overwhelming sense of love and sort of almost like a deep sense of peace that you experienced maybe that's what propels you through life and through your work um Maybe that's why, partly why you are who you are today. Um, but what what do you think triggered it? Like, do you think there was anything? Was, was it anything in the prayers that you were saying, or was it anything? Um, yeah. Happened, or do you think? It did, it yeah. Completely random. I, yeah, I don't think it was a prayer because I I was about ten, so I was praying for Spider Man <laughs> and B. A. Barakas to become Christians. I, I had like a list of my favorite superheroes and stuff <laughs> so I, don't, I don't think it was that I think um I think you know what it's really um I you know it's never happened again and um and yeah I just I yeah I think it is a little bit of a, a mystery I mean I've had um I have had similar experiences later on in life through different pathways and um and I think, you know, my, that this, this gave me a, a curiosity and, um, and I think also just an, an openness. I was feeling like, um, that maybe the experience of that phenomenon versus the, the ability to sort of articulate it with language, 
mm. gave me this feeling that that you know religious books and scripture it's it's always it's you know it's passing or the the essence of it is sort of an experience that's translated to words and, and to books and and if you can you know through the reading of those books um have access to these you know to an experience like that then it's suddenly um it, it makes a, it makes a lot of sense but just the words alone without the experience um didn't resonate for me so I was kind of interested in the phenomenon maybe more than the the sort of language within the Bible. Um, and so uh, as my sort of journey evolved, I've, I've had a, a number of other moments. I think an, another aspect is my dad's a, a sailor. And so growing up sailing all the time um, and sort of spending a lot of time on the ocean and um, I did some like long ocean expeditions where you know, I'd be up at night crossing the Atlantic and uh, you do sort of shifts. So one person goes, actually everyone goes below deck to sleep and one person is on night duty and you kind of swap out. And uh, and yeah, just kind of in the middle of the, the Atlantic in quite strong winds where you're trying to keep the boat on a course. Um, you know, I had these feelings of... Um, expansion uh where i was sort of completely forgotten who i was and i kind of like expanded into this soup of existence which but i, thought I can't express yeah. it as well as um on the boat as others i'm, I'm constantly yeah on, on the boat just um you know it's basically sort of six six hours in darkness yeah. um you know with the stars above you and um and just sort of gliding through this you know the dark ocean with the the way the way the waves break is is sort of fascinating so when there's obviously you get white water when the waves are breaking and when you're on a, a broad reach the kind of wave picks you up and then you accelerate to the bottom and you've got to keep the, the boat on a on a straight line because it can tend to sort of curve round into the wind so there's this again like this kind of focus on a you're connecting to the elements and you're reading the water and i think there's something about that practice where you you're so focused and connected to the environment around you that you can have a, a, a an experience that sort of disconnects you from being you and you sort of expand into something more and it's just, it's a hard thing to pin down i mean there's a, we spoke before about Rumi, and um you know i read quite a lot and I always get the quotes wrong but when he was talking about meditation um he spoke about the idea that sort of the, the the sort of normal waking state is like being on the surface of an ocean so like you're you're a wave and you know that you're a wave because you you look at the other waves around you and you can see that you're a unique shape but you exist in relationship to these other waves on the surface and uh, through meditation, it's like a process of sinking down deeper in, into the ocean. And as you sink down, you expand through these sort of ever expanding rings of being until you're so distanced from the surface that you've lost that connection to you as a personality, but you've expanded into, into the ocean. You suddenly have this realization that you are the ocean in a certain way. And, um, and I think that's a, a great metaphor, but again, these, these experiences are slightly they're they're really moving and they give me um sort of the direction and motivation to explore the projects that i do and maybe they don't translate so well to um to jibber jabber when i'm trying to explain it but they really did uh, affect my path you know yeah. they give me the uh, vision the vision confidence to explore what i'm doing it's very clear actually you're talking about these experiences that are very immersive and that's ultimately what you do you you create these immersive experiences through virtual reality and it's actually quite astonishing that you were able to find that medium which is directly it sort of translates or embodies what you experienced sort of growing up um that sense of connectedness mm. So, I mean, I really, I'm so excited to talk more about your work, but I just wanted to, first of all, to just talk a bit more about your experience growing up. I know that you, you, you mentioned your dad as an art teacher and also that you're a twin. Um, and I'm interested in, in this sense of competition and perfectionism that I think were both there in your childhood but yet 
they seem to have a kind of positive impact on you. And I'm really interested in exploring that. Um, yeah, the old competitive twin. Oh, it's, it is a thing. It's a problem. It's like when you're born, it's like, okay, on your marks, get set, go. And you're, you're running along next to your, next to your brother and you, you've got all of the same opportunities. So whether you feel like whether people are actually comparing you to one another or not, you sort of, you feel that. And, um, but also you, you love each other. So, I mean, I, I've got such a wonderful twin brother and although we're competitive, we also celebrate each other's successes and we're really, um, you know, I, I, winning and losing it is a funny thing. So with the art stuff, because we were both, uh, we both had a talent um, for, for drawing and, and painting and the kind of within, the school environment, it was part of what sort of defined us as uh, as characters. You know, it's like, oh, Andy and Barney, they're the art teachers, uh, twins, and they're, they're like, oh, have you seen their drawings? And, you know, it was, it was the thing, you know, as you're trying to work out who you are, this became a key, a key sort of component. But, yeah, I'd, I'd like put the lights off and pretend to go to bed. And so Andy would go to bed. Then I'd sneak out and continue drawing my pine cone like to get ahead of him <laughs> so got that. and and actually this the competitive the competitive thing is something that um drove me it was like a big driver um up until relatively recently so my you know my kind of reference points would be you know when i was doing drawings i'd, I'd try and like analyze you know, Caravaggio and Leonardo, not that I ever got to that kind of level, but I'd be always, the thing that I was focused on, I'd always try and look to the best people in that practice, whether it was photography or animation, and I'd kind of um, a- apply the pinecone technique in a way of um, deconstructing and learning from, and copying as well, like copying mm. in order to learn. Um, and that was how I kind of, I suppose, how my career progressed from um, illustration into photography into um, animation and um, and and then it's from the sort of animation world that I started to step more into working with creative coders and programmers to create um, interactive experiences and ultimately these kind of virtual reality experiences that we do now so uh, there's been a kind of journey there, but there, there's also this key moment, I think, where the idea of being a director, um, because I ended up doing music videos and, and commercials, which from one angle is like, oh, great, dude, you made it. You know, you wanted to, th- th- there's a moment where you've never done a music video and you're like, oh, I could never do music videos. And you, you go for it and then suddenly you're doing them. And, and the same with commercials, it's a competitive business. So to actually, get to a point where you can you know where you're directing commercials you have to really sort of go for it and fully commit but then also with that pathway there's this real feeling of sort of oh yeah I did I did well there like I did well that was a good idea that I had and and so it's sort of it can be not so good for the ego you you can start to think of it as um as your idea and and your project and I think as I've as I've kind of matured i guess i've let go of that stuff and realizing that that my role is more of um is sort of encouragement and sharing the, the vision and and so the way to to really pull out the best expression of an idea comes not through you as an individual at all although my role is to kind of i guess steer the ship and hold a vision but really it's about um collaboration and relationships right. and um and and share, sharing that vision that's really and, and that's something that's changed yeah that's been like, a, I wanted to ask you actually yeah. about ego because there's got to be a certain amount of ego in being an artist like there has to be that belief mm. and there has to be that sense of of this idea and I want to project my idea into the world but yet they seem you seem to be able to counteract that kind of ego energy with I don't know maybe it's like a sense of purpose you have such a strong sense of purpose that it counteracts that ego that it can just kind of run away it can just 
sort of have its own negative energy and, and sort of take over everything and, and you seem to be able mm. to go beyond that so is that just something that you've achieved as you've gotten older as you were just explaining or have you always had uh, this capacity to keep your ego in check maybe with a sense of awareness uh, I think it's something that has um, sort of emerged in later life I think um yeah, there's, it's interesting. There's, for me, there was a transition point where I felt like a genuine artist. Um, and so up until a certain point, I was more of a creative problem solver in that I could, uh, you know, come up with ideas around a brief, listen to a music video and get, get a vision for an idea or, or, you know, respond to a sort of advertising or design brief. Um, and that's like that activates a certain part of the mind and um but there's a, a deeper place that the artwork comes from which is feels less like it's sort of engineered as in like i'm gonna sit down and solve a problem or i'm gonna sit down and i'm gonna come up with an idea of something i want to make so you know all of that is sort of engineered in your head and and it feels very much like it's sort of coming from you and i think there's been this um, slow transition, um, which has happened over the last sort of 10 years, probably, but um, where I've basically been um, quite openly exploring ideas and experimenting. So it, it's, for me, artwork is when there is no brief and you're, you, you're able, there's no freedom, no one's telling you what to do. So you can explore whatever's interesting you. And so by sort of diving into my passions, which sort of relate back to these sensations of the oceanic feeling, like expanding, um, dissolving a sense of self and expanding. It's like through really, I guess, nurturing those interests, I felt like um, the idea takes me rather than, it doesn't come out of me. It's like, a, actually the, the metaphor would be, um, I'm in a, I'm in like a rubber ring in um in a river and the river's the river's taking me right. so it's like it's not coming it's not coming from me at all I, I have to surrender to the flow yeah. and it's almost like the more you surrender to this vision and it, these once this thing starts to happen you wake up at night with with like a, a vision and like it, it, it it's like being um possessed by something and um and I, so, yeah, my experience has been a transition from sort of ideas that were engineered in a different part of my brain to a feeling of surrendering to a purpose or a deeper vision or a kind of destiny or something. It's quite a, a different sensation. And so when inspiration comes, it's often in um, quite an overwhelming feeling. You get like a feeling that goes up to the top of your head and um, it's quite, there's like a physiological feeling and that and then this flow just comes out of you and then I'll just I'll jump on the laptop I wanted to get back to sketchbooks and I did for a while but I'm back on the old laptop because I can kind of I can get that thing down much quicker so you're, you're once, once it's gone it's sorry you know, sometimes it's uh no no it's just that sometimes it's like a wave that passes through yeah. you so that first um got that first practice. moment it, you got to get it yeah. um but then you can revisit it and it just becomes, you know, it, it's something that becomes the vision of it, which is it, where I think that, is my thing. Where, Hold on to that. Yeah, that flow state that, you know, that lots of creative people talk about. You're describing it and it, it's so interesting the way you describe it as connecting to something deeper and then surrendering, which really is the opposite, isn't it, of, of control, controlling the outcome and um and that kind of fear-based sort of state that so many of us that go into especially around work and projects and yeah. things that, that mean something to us and I was actually listening to a really interesting talk um and it was making me think about you when I was preparing for the interview and it was all about this idea of mystery and how ultimately curiosity is like the key so it's how we get into the mystery of being which is what it is to be a human what it is to be alive it's it's a it's a great mystery and that's all to do with this sense of the don't know mind which is like a sort of buddhist idea this sort of beginner's mind 
um, which again, I think you really seem to embody. Um, it's the opposite of, of knowing, you know, it's the sense of, well, what questions can I ask and, and how can I, you know, get, get, to know and understand things better and and this sense of curiosity mm. at least from one thing to the other um and yeah. I, I i sense that curiosity is such a big part of you have you got any idea or any sense of, of where that came from sort of as a child you know it was it just something that was encouraged um do you think it was really cultivated by your parents or do you think it's just who you are innately yeah maybe it was stimulated by like those sort of that those sort of moments i was talking about earlier were quite um sort of em emotionally overwhelming in some respects so th that they gave me a, a curiosity of like what was going on like what was that about <laughs> what's going on there and then and then so i think somehow the curiosity's coming from that and maybe it's paired with um the way that i've been able to kind of shape my journey as a sort of animator photographer artist that that somehow um you know that lens of observation um has been i, f I find that there's um, a sort of beauty in dimensions that exist beyond our perception and i'm really sort of fascinated in these um this sort of well, I guess in some ways that the limits of our senses and the world that we experience mm. um, is, you know, is everything that we know. But yet um, we, we know through when we look at the world through a scientific lens, which could be said to be exploring phenomenon and, and measuring and observing phenomenon that exists beyond the limits of our eyeballs and our touch and, you know, our, our senses. So I found like that be to be a really interesting it's like peering into the mystery of who we are and where we come from and and, and like there's so many great examples richard Feynman, who's um i've been following you know his lectures i must have listened to all of his lectures multiple times he's so full of the sense of awe and wonder mm. through as experienced through science he's got this great story actually where he says you know if an artist um He's, he's like sat down with a friend of his and his, his friend is an artist and they're looking at a flower and his, his friend says that, uh, it, the artist says, oh, I've got a, a deeper connection to the beauty of this flower because I've analyzed it. So my eyeballs and my, my brain is sort of attuned to the subtleties and variations in color and texture. And so, so therefore the artist can have a, a deeper sense of the beauty of the flower because he's, of this connection through observation. And then Richard's response is, um, well, a scientist has a, a, a different connection because he can see things that the scientist can't. So he understands the reason the flower is red is because it's co-evolved with the eyeball of a pollinator. And so that pollinator is attracted to red. And that's, you know, there's this connection, this sort of co-evolution. And it raises the question, does the uh, pollinator have an aesthetic sense like humans do? You know, why do we find flowers attractive? And then there's there's all these other sort of um, layers of beauty within a flower. The fact that it's like weaving life out of sunlight, the process of photosynthesis. You know, all of the uh, all of the sort of inner intricacies of a flower only ever add to a deeper sense of appreciation and sort of awe and wonder. They never subtract. And I think that's that's like uh, that's the hook of science. Like once you start to really um, explore, you know, these the deep mysteries, then you realize that there's these, you know, these in incredible teams who are like probing the boundaries of reality, you know, with Hubble Space Telescope. In fact, that, that's another amazing story that, you know, you can look up at the night sky and, you know, we've been doing that since the dawn of time. We've got all of these fantastical stories and myths, but like what could be more bonkers than being able to see a photo of a nebula taken by Hubble and seeing that like the the just the beauty of that like the colors and and then learning that that's the womb from which you came that exploding stars created the heavy elements necessary to make life so all of the elements that you know that needed to exist to make a, a human and to make carbon-based life have come through this journey of exploding stars and planets forming 
Well made. And so that's like a yeah. crazy story. And yet it's like rock solid and they've measured it and observed it and the, the theories hold. And so I'm, I'm kind of like really into the process basically of collaborating with scientists, um, yeah. learning, kind of go, going in open, learning and then thinking how can those how can these phenomena that are observed through cameras or CT scanners or LIDAR scanners or, you know, peering into the human body with fMRI scanners, how can those data sets be translated back into experiences that anybody can access? So this, you know, what, what this can science, I learn about? This yeah, sort of merging on. of science and art, it's, it's really <laughs> that the, in the nub of what you do. And mm. I know that there, you have, you know, some really there have been some really big influences on your work but can you just tell us a bit more about what marshmallow laser feast is and what you do yeah so it's um myself robin mcnicholas and memo atkin set it up about 10 years ago and uh when we started the company the intention was to invest in our passion projects so to do commercial work to raise money and also look to arts council and different the uk is wonderful for um funding programs so we've always received sort of funding from different um different funding bodies that help support projects but we invest money from other work that we do back into our artworks so we all kind of agreed let's take low salaries and yeah. invest in the projects you want to do and it's not there's a there's a business plan behind this as well because you I, if, if you're asking someone else to pay to give you money to do the things you love, then you should be spending your own money on that as well to, to sort of to seed it, to create a feedback loop where you can demonstrate to others what, what your vision is. Um, so that's been our process and, um, and, and we're so, really collaborative. And tell us how, open. you know, the, the kind of the, the concepts and the vision behind a lot of what you do I mean I know that mm. it's all kind of coming from this deep sense of wonder for the world challenging our concepts of reality and you know enabling these different experiences and perspectives through what you do um your first kind of big really creative project was in the eyes of the animal is that right yeah, that was our first sort of virtual reality, uh, sort of nature focused virtual reality piece. Yeah. And can you tell us about that? What, how did that work? So that was um, virtual reality. Was, we, previously to that, we were exploring kind of this uh, projection mapping and like kind of playful ideas about to how, how to sort of blur, blur the lines between the real world and the virtual world. And so we'd kind of been quite captivated by the kind of illusions that you can create with projection mapping and different tracking systems. But without going too much into that, then this, we, we were also doing commercial projects using that, those techniques and, and then this opportunity um, to create an artwork in, as part of Grisdale Sculpture Park. Um, the festival was called And Festival and um, the forestry permission were involved. And uh, essentially we got, an open brief and um, we were asked to create a sort of an artwork in this forest environment. So we worked with the local scientists to understand what the forest might look like through the eyes of four organisms. So there was a mosquito, a dragonfly, a frog and an owl. And, um, and then we were just basically fascinated because virtual reality had just sort of had a resurgence and we were experimenting with it. And it was like, oh, wait, you can get, you can kind of take someone out of their skin. That's really interesting. I'm having an experience where I can't see my body. So what would the world look like if I was to embody another organism? You know, what is, what is a forest? Like how, how does, how do, like t time is, um, is our, our experience of time is like hardwired into our bodies. But if I'm a dragonfly, my eyeballs are so close to my brain that I'm experiencing a much higher kind of frame rate of reality. So like if a dragonfly was flew into a cinema, it would, it would see, it wouldn't see an image. It wouldn't see a movie, like an image sequence in the way we see it. It would see um, like a quite a slow slideshow where 
each frame is on the screen for like eight seconds and then the next frame would come up for eight seconds so to us that's just a, a sequence but to a dragonfly it's it, it's sort of perception of time is completely different so it's really interesting it also sees the color spectrums it sees into the ultraviolet and infrared spectrum and is it and i've done right some that, scientific studies on that wow and is it right that the the experience of dragonfly when you were actually having the virtual reality experience you also felt what it was like to fly yeah we had a haptic backpack called Subpack, which is um again part of this sort of resurgence of virtual reality um you know lots of startups um are engaging with different devices that can kind of give you a sense of touch or haptic feedback and so this was a I think you can think of it like a vibrating backpack that sort of goes down the center of your back and so um purely it was pure luck in a way we were playing with it and then in the dragonfly sequence you know we're, we're playing with the idea of embodiment and so yeah when you when you take off from a log you're kind of on a log in this forest and you're, all of the color palettes are different um everything's moving much slower so it feels like you're underwater like the movement of wind through the forest is slowed right down and when you take off your it starts vibrating between your shoulder blades and uh it totally, it like, it really, it, it's these little nudges that take you out of your feeling of being, you know, you and offer the opportunity to sort of escape into this, this dreamlike world of, um, I guess, the more than human world, like what, what, what your raw, it's almost like your, your awareness gets flavored by other, other sort of sensory, uh, apparatus or however you put it i mean there's one thing to acknowledge on these projects that there's um you know you can't you can't offer people an experience that exists outside the senses that they have so for example if you're a blind person um we could both be touching a lemon and i could be you know we could share the sensation of like temperature and texture and smell and, and, and everything but the the colors of a lemon are impossible to articulate um, without having eyesight you can't use words you know if you try and explain the richness of yellow and like the subtleties of green and and the, the various tones you, words don't even get close so in a sense when you're translating senses that you don't have to ones that you do there's a kind of poetry to that process mm. and um, so it's not like a direct translation it's inspired by the limits of of what we understand about these different little critters and then that that forms the kind of basis of the worlds that we create yeah and it feels to me like there's actually a really great and deep sense of compassion that comes out of what you do because i suppose if you're experiencing what it feels like to be an owl or a frog you can have a real sense of compassion for them. And actually, rather than learning that or reading about it, actually feeling it in your body is a very different way of, of, of encouraging that sense of compassion for the natural world. I mean, I, I've heard you talk before about Arne mm. Nass um, yeah. and his ecology. How, yeah. how did that influence the the work in the eyes of an animal? Well, I think there's, um, to the first part of the, the question, there was, um, yeah, this feeling of empathy. So in, in some ways, you can think of empathy and connection as, as being the same thing. And, um, you know, that Arne Nass is talking about, um, you know, what is the sort of, what, what's the root cause of our kind of ability ability to sort of ravage the planet where you know human wants and needs everything is everything is assessed based on its value to humans and and used as a resource you know what wh where's that coming from and so he's talking about um you know if you if you're sense the story that you tell yourself about yourself in relationship to other things if you're existing as sort of something that's separate from a tree and a river and everything else then the um and also that your experience of reality is so detached um from the things that you consume then there's um you know it's it's no wonder that you know you can eat 
eat food or, or like use moisturizer you know you sort of reach for your moisturizer without realizing it's connected to um, palm oil and deforestation but if you lived in that rainforest and you had to deforest you know your your front garden and witness the the damage and devastation that goes on in order to moisturize your face no one's no one's going to be doing that so there's this basically this detachment from nature that i think comes as part of a consequence of of urban living mm. but another element to it is about the underlying sort of myth of separation that if you see yourself as something that's separate from nature mm. then it becomes much easier to treat nature as a commodity yeah and i think um you know, there, there can be these perspective shifts. So uh, as an example, like a tree, what's a, wh- like, what's a tree got to do with me? A tree's just, you know, they're down there in the street, they're doing their thing, they're pretty static. They're almost like architectural in that they, you know, a tree being a living, breathing being is, is quite distant from my senses. But, um, but yet they are living, breathing beings, ancient beings, and they create the oxygen needed to sustain life on, on Earth. And in some ways, a tree is like a river that's um, connecting, you know, it's made out of, of carbon from, from the air. About 95% of a tree is made from the carbon in, in the air. So they're, draw, they're constantly drawing this CO2 from the air. And through the process of uh, photosynthesis, they're creating the glucose that then flows through all of all of life you know that process of photosynthesis is is sort of weaving energy out of sunlight that flows through the entire food chain so from that perspective um you know a tree is this kind of bridge between heaven and earth taking energy from the cosmos and weaving life out of it and and you come you come after that process you're connected to it you're completely dependent on it and it's no coincidence that you're lungs follow that same kind of branching structure because um the out breath of the tree is you know is is necessary for your in breath and your out breath in turn the out breath of the animal kingdom creates carbon dioxide that flows back in the tree so you're living in total symbiosis in relationship to a tree but as soon as you start to explore that as a sensation like in the piece we made ocean of air we, we use breath sensors and heart rate monitors so that you could see you could see your out breath flowing into the plant kingdom and, and you could also draw in the oxygen from the tree, like these rivers of oxygen into your body. And, you, and we used your pulse to sort of reveal the way that that flows through your cardiovascular system. And you could interact with other people in, in this kind of everyone sort of embodied these branching beings, which is also interesting because instead of seeing like a, a woman or a certain ethnicity, or, or, or a man or an age, um, age and gender is all tra- transparent. When you see just people as these sort of underlying branching structures, you see what's universal and, and not what the differences are. So there's kind of elements to that project, which is like, we're connected in ways that we can't perceive. And yeah. so I suppose like Absolutely. to sort of wrap that up. Yeah, it's just that it's just that the that transition is key, I think, to, uh, to to reveal that you exist in relationship to mycelium and trees and pollinators and sunlight and water. And, you know, we're, we're totally entangled in this web of life. So um, I think this is the underlying message that we're exploring conceptually, but we're exploring it as a sensation and as an experience, whereas in everyday life, it's you can only experience it, I guess, as a as an idea or a concept um, rather than a sort of direct sensation through these immersive technologies. Yeah, and uh, I mean the way you described how that um, that immersive experience that exhibition worked. We live in a nation of air, and that was actually on at the Saatchi Gallery, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it. I know that Alan Watts was also really has been a big influence on your work. And I found a quote and it almost seems to directly explain what you do. He said, we need a new domain, not of science alone, but of experience and feeling a new way of understanding human experience and a new feeling of what it is to be an I. And that just seems to be exactly what you're (laughs) describing this sense of having an embodied experience of being connected to 
all these different organisms and life forms that exist. Uh, I, oh, I think it, it's really fascinating. Um, I love that quote. Yeah. I've not heard that one before. That was, oh, no, really? That was spot on. I need, I'd have, yeah, you'd have to send me that. Um, I will. Um, and you have a new yeah. project coming up, which sounds, again, like it's so much a part of this embodying, embodying nature um, and becoming part of, of nature. Mm. What, what are you yeah, working on at the moment? Yeah, so, I mean, actually, so the companies, there's three creative directors, um, myself, uh, Robbie McNicholas and Urson Han Urson. And, um, and the way we work is to sort of cross-pollinate on ideas, but we sort of individually direct different projects. So I'm kind of answering about, the, you know, the projects that I'm leading on, but actually we do quite a broad range of, of stuff and each of us has our own kind of specific flavour. It's quite a nice... Um, there's a nice relationship of, of how the studio sort of um, works and we all influence each other, but we also kind of lead our own visions. So the, the project that's coming up for me is um, the human ecosystem. So when exploring the forest ecosystem and thinking about, you know, the underlying sort of currents or, or rhythms or flows of energy that, that move through a forest, um, you can think of those movements of energy is like the, the movement of the elements and how um, how they're sustaining life and flowing through the ecosystem in cycles. Um, so yeah, you could, so one, one specific one is you can say, let's, let's explore the out breath of the tree as oxygen. And so and let's go on that journey of oxygen and, and see what happens as it flows into the human body. Um, and so it's, you know, it's passing the nostrils. In fact, it's almost worth, do it sort of closing your eyes and thinking about it so when you when you breathe in it's passing through your airways down into your lungs and then um it's sort of held there for a moment where it diffuses into the bloodstream and um and it, when, when it when it goes from airways into bloodstream it's almost like a leaf landing on a on a fast moving river that when the oxygen tsh, touches down in the bloodstream then it flows very quickly um through another another tree-like branching structure um, straight up into the heart. And actually you've got these two parallel tree-like structures, one for the lung where the airways are, and then the other one that's carrying the blood to the heart. And they're really entangled um, when you look at the medical data. It's in incredibly beautiful. Um, and then when it gets to the heart, you know, the sort of the, cent the center of it all, it's then branching up into the head you know, through an artery that's about as uh, the, the diameter of a bottle of wine, the top of a bottle of wine, and it's moving at three feet a second. So it's incredible pressures. It takes about three seconds to get to the tip of your hand and a minute to do a lap of your body. So this process mm -hmm. is, is delivering oxygen to every cell. All, all the trillions of cells that make up your body are getting oxygen. And it's, it's kind of fun, you know, when you get a, when you're on a, you're kind of squashed up on a plane and you, you, you wake up and your arm's completely dead. Like once you loosen it up and get the blood flowing, you, you sort of, you're feeling all of those trillions of cells going, oh man, oh, I need that oxygen, need that oxygen. You know, they're numb. You can't even feel anything. It's like they're almost dead. They need that oxygen to, for respiration in order to function. And, uh, and so like as you, to, so to, to explore the kind of mystery of the human body is, um, or just exploring that flow of oxygen it's um it's not only like really fascinating and um in terms of like being able to scale it up so i've, I've gone around in a sort of weird jibber jabber here the, the experience is uh if you could scale up the human body to the size of a forest and just go and explore it with your friends be like oh yeah let's go for a stroll let's go for a stroll okay let's follow the flow of oxygen down to the heart and lungs oh wait there's the, the blood's going up to the brain you can go up into the brain and it's all based on medical data so you've got these incredibly beautiful structures the brain has like the left and right hemisphere they're they're really quite similar so this, they're, they're like mirrors of each other they're they're slightly different but there's enough s symmetry that you kind of see these two sort of flowering branching um patterns and spirals that that, that, that look very similar um to left and right 
And so it's offering that opportunity to kind of rediscover our inner branching being. And, and in doing so, you're you're revealing the, the body is something that's not static. It's more like a whirlpool and, or a shape that, that sort of, that life takes and that it's, it's, there's nothing static about it. It's always in a process of, um, of change. And I think, um, you know, like with these other narratives, when you explore these rivers, you realize that they're flowing through all of life and they connect you mm. um, to everything else. But this is so that's that's the one we're working on, and that's a virtual reality project again. Yeah, it's called Evolver, and um, it's a virtual reality project. And we're lucky enough to have uh, Terence Malick as an exec producer, and Ed Pressman, and uh, Johnny Greenwood, and um, some other great musicians have done music for the different chapters. Mm. So it's kind of as our projects evolve their evolve yeah as they, they, they evolve we're, we're starting to sort of i guess have opportunities to work with amazing collaborators and scientists as well like merlin sheldrake and you know really interesting thinkers are very much part of our process of research although he's not involved in this project we've worked with him on on other projects and um and you know we we spend a lot of time sort of interviewing and gathering research to help inform the artworks um yeah. yeah i mean some of the, the the scientific or like the medical imaging that you mentioned before when you're describing mm. the kind of this sense of like the map of the insides of a lung and how that really yeah. is, you know mirrors this visual of a, the branches of a tree um yeah that's really inspired that you're actually able to work with science and scientists um, on that sort of in that level and on that level of detail. Um, I mean, did you how how did that work in terms of did you just think we need to speak to a scientist about this and then go on a sort of journey of of contacting you know people and it eventually led you to to where you needed it to to go or how did that work? Yeah. Yeah, so there's like, um, as we were exploring ocean of air, we, we, we started thinking about oxygen through the body. And then the more I thought about that, the more I got excited by the potential. But then my first port of call is just like Google searches for, um, you know, different scanning techniques for the body. I was kind of asking myself the question, like, what's the Hubble Space Telescope for the human body? Because there's a beauty that comes through you know, without Hubble, what does what does deep space, what does a nebula look like without Hubble? You know, the it's like the technology is so key to revealing the beauty. So um, I did a deep dive into that, and on YouTube I came across this thing called I think it was called the Beauty of Blood Flow, and it was by the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, um, Mavis actually M E V I S at the Fraunhofer Institute, and um, so I just. I saw the name of the professor behind it and um, and then I emailed Bianca through LinkedIn and then she'd um, she'd already seen our work. So she was like, oh, we've we've got an artist in residency program so we can support you. Oh, Do you wow. want to come to Germany? And then we so I went over there and wow. Um, and the project's been I mean, the, the, the amazing thing that the Fraunhofer managed to do, which is motivated by, um, you know, solving or it's, it's all motivated by saving lives so they were able to create a series of 3d scans fmri scans of the heart and then they um they took loads and loads of them in the sequence and they ordered them in, in in sequence and from the black and white data they're able to generate um the direction and velocity of blood flow through the heart and then they made a fluid simulation of it mm -hmm. and it's insanely beautiful and i think there's something about the heart that we're we're obviously so familiar, it's like they're in the background and you know, in lots of great rhythms in music, there's mm -hmm. the sort of heartbeat rhythm and it's something that we're really familiar with, but maybe it's just on the periphery of our awareness. Mm -hmm. Actually, while I was thinking about the project, I had my, my phone on my knee and some sunlight came through and bounced off the, the screen and um, up onto the wall at quite a distance in, in my house. And then I noticed that my phone was wobbling with my pulse, which was translating to the movement of the light on the wall. 
<laughs> and I was kind of like, oh, that's interesting. And I was like, yeah, it's, you know, it, maybe we tune out of it because we're, mm. our minds are occupied with other stuff. But when you start to pay attention, that rhythm is, is really intuitive and we're really deeply connected to it. Mm. Um, so I, I found that experiencing that in VR was both like, really really beautiful but it's like seeing an old friend that you've never you've never seen before you're sort of oh yeah oh, hello old friend I've not uh, we've not really met but uh you know oh, nice to finally see you that's really so interesting this this sense of the rhythms of the heart I love that but also um you know is this question isn't there of like is is our heart the nub of like is that the essence of who we are or are we our brain and I was listening to a really interesting story uh, being recounted of um, a woman whose husband had died and got killed in a car accident and he had donated his heart um, and it was it ended up being um, transplanted into the body of a young boy and this woman um, who lost her husband was recounting this story of how moving it was when she met this boy because she felt this presence of her husband through the boy and how actually um, he, he had changed since this heart transplant in that, you know, parts of, of how he experienced the world were different. He, he had taken on like different kind of tastes and interests that were really in in keeping with her husband and I found that so mm. fascinating you know this sense of is are we our hearts or are we our minds uh, very very interesting that is really interesting what great uh yeah I mean it's a, it's a big old mystery we're, I think we've done we've done pretty well I mean there's some amazing stuff that we do know um or, or I guess the beauty of science is that it can, it's just, it's trying, it's like making its best guess and trying to measure and, but there's a constant process of rewriting the books and, mm. you know, new theories. So and always that it's, it's like an ongoing, it's an ongoing conversation yeah. investigating the mystery of, of it all. So I, I love it that it's not such a, it's not like we've solved everything at all. Yes. It's, um, and it's a again, old mystery. It comes- it comes back to that thing like you said of mystery and it's that thing of being present to the mystery and to the wonder and having this sense of awe for it all like even if we don't ever fully understand it you know that's okay um Mm. but this sense of um what we could do with virtual reality like the potential of it and how it can really inspire wonder in people is is something I I wanted to ask you about because I heard um, a really interesting TED talk about the potential of virtual reality um, and news and how this particular journalist believed that, you know, if we were to use virtual reality when we, you know, when we tell news stories, especially those involving people that we find it hard to relate to, you know, people in developing countries in in different parts of the world, often the kind of stories that we don't always feel that much empathy when we read them or they're not the kind of thing that we might be drawn to. But she was suggesting that through the use of virtual reality and news, there could be this greater sense of, of compassion that could be ignited and um, it's very interesting. There's also this element of activism in in sort of your work. Um, so, I mean, there's there's great potential in the reality of um, sorry in the future of virtual reality. Um, how how do you see that playing out? I think um, I mean our, our focus is on um, you know creating connections to the the more than human world um, with uh, so we're we're less interested in sort of human to human interactions, but for sure there's um, you know virtual reality is um, a, an incredibly powerful medium for um, for empathy because it can show you show yourself from a different perspective or show you other other perspectives where you can embody someone other than yourself, and so I think that can be incredibly powerful and the trajectory of these immersive technologies is you know 
uh, whether you like it or, or not, the technology is evolving fast. And, um, you know, in the next sort of five, 10 years, uh, uh, the ability to have very, very, um, is, is going to be, it's going to be there. It's, it's, it's happening. So, um, Oh, we're sorry, Bonnie, you just broke, and, um, you broke up a little bit there. I just missed Oh, sorry, let me just... Um, okay. Sorry, you said the um, ability so, to have... Yeah, the ability to have, um, yeah, d- deep experience, like the, the depth of the immersion or the, the sort of the power to immerse audiences and and to sort of... It's just basically that technology is evolving very fast, so uh, it's going to become more and more powerful um, as a as a medium. And so, you know, with that comes good things and, and bad things. But it's very much our focus is 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 really on, um, you know, how can we use this technology to kind of give nature a voice and address that the kind of underlying, you know, cre- creating connections and connections and empathy being almost like the same thing, you know, is it possible to have an experience of um, a distant, you know, old growth forest ecosystem that's under threat and through that experience be moved to ha- have a level of connection where you want to do something to to protect it. And um, and whether that's, uh, I think, back to the sort of RNA NAS side, there's a deeper element to this, which is about a nudge towards, you know, how do you, if you to draw a line around, you know, where you begin and where you end, you know, what, what kind of concept do you hold? You know, can you expand your sense of self to include the body of the earth? Is that, is that something that's possible? And part of that kind of, I think part of that, uh, maybe the power of virtual reality is that you can create these experiences that sort of can be a nudge in that, in that direction. And, um, yeah, so that's kind of, yeah, that that's where we're we're focused, and um, yeah, this... yeah, hopefully, yeah, it can have a have some some sort of impact. I mean, it's motivated by a, a number of reasons, but it's just like the, the beauty and how unusual and and sort of beautiful and bizarre life is on on this planet, and um, it's uh, it's like yeah, it's just a fascinating. Um, thing to be exploring at this moment in time where this technology allows us to kind of explore perception and, and in terms you know, of that, the boundaries of our being definitely and in terms of that that sort of purpose is you know is your purpose to really inspire that in other people this sense of awe and wonder you know is that do you yeah. have that very strong drive yeah yeah and um and uh, yeah, I suppose in, in some, it's it's less of uh, something that's sort of preconceived and it's more sort of, like we're saying at the beginning, there's um, this sort of momentum and flow that we're just going with, um, which is taking us to endangered ecosystems where we're 3D scanning them and, and, and bringing experiences of those far off places to urban environments so that connections can be made. and. Um, you know, the longer term trajectory, I think, of what we're looking to do is, you know, release these virtual worlds that, you know, millions of people can have access to and um, and where they can learn about these sort of underlying scientific narratives, I guess, that, um, that, that sort of shape our understanding of the world. And that can help them sort of experience themselves and the world differently in a fuller yeah, a more profound way, which is, is so yeah, perspective shifts, yeah. out of body experiences, yeah. sort of scientific hallucinations or something like this is like a powerful perspective shifts that can ask the deeper questions of who you are and how you exist in relationship to the other forms of life that we share. This journey, you know, as we glide through the Milky Way together <laughs> on this rock, you know, it's uh just kind of waking up that feeling of like cowabunga it's like, like what it's like whoa <laughs> it's like yeah, that kind I mean, of cowabunga like what is going on it's bonkers yeah what what uh, am i and yeah how am i and and how do i fit with everyone else and, and i mean it, you know there's a question that i always ask at the end of the podcast and 
I almost feel like I know the answer of, of what you're going to mm. say because um, you've kind of been answering it the whole way through our conversation. But um, but I'll ask you anyway. So so the idea behind the tenderness revolution, um, as in, is having this quality of tenderness for ourselves and others is in the three C's because they enable us to fully see the truth about the way things are. And they are courage, curiosity, and compassion. And I wanted to ask you if you had to choose one of these qualities that means the most to you in your life, what would you choose out of curiosity, courage, and compassion? Oh, that's a tricky one. They're so um they're so in they're so entangled because yeah. um these sort of um the like curiosity without um courage maybe doesn't lead to the places it, it could do. Yeah. And uh and uh and also I think sort of curiosity also creates compassion in a way. So if yeah. you're not interested in if you're not interested in engaging with like perspectives other than your own, if you don't have that curiosity, then it's it, it's hard to make those connections that, yeah. that, that that lead to compassion. So it's a, a difficult one. I think for me, there's been a sort of that that maybe the courage element is something my dad sort of notices in me of just sort of going um going for stuff and taking risks so maybe that's maybe that's a key part to um to sort of making progress is that you know you need to you need to take risks and, and like commit and also in the framework that the, the risks that you might think are there like in the grander scheme of things that are really they're really nothing so i think it's um feeling that you can just like boldly step into um just take, taking risks and following your passions i think is um is like if i wasn't doing that if i was more conservative then maybe we wouldn't be talking about this stuff so maybe oh, that's i key love i love that you part. you said courage and I, I you know we've talked so much about curiosity and obviously you're right they're all very very much interconnected but I love that you said courage and I, I do actually think that's a huge part of what you do because I think a big part of being an artist is sharing your work with the wider world and you know there must always be this this sense or maybe there isn't but perhaps a sense of a fear of failure or a fear of judgment and um, you need to have courage to go beyond that. Um, or maybe you need like a deep sense of confidence. I don't know. What, what do you think it is that enables you to have this courage? Mm. Maybe the um, that sort of the, those experiences of um, maybe expanding beyond or, or feeling connected to something bigger then yeah yeah then there's there's something in that where um i don't know quite what it is but there's there's something in that process that maybe gives you a, a yeah. perspective where the idea that, that you can personally sort of fail at something it just doesn't feel like it's such a and failure is so yeah. essential yeah. anyway we're constantly yeah. failing and um and experimenting and you know sort of struggling financially and then having moments where things align and it goes well so there's a constant process so it's super healthy to just be constantly failing and pushing boundaries and and that's what makes it all fun um and I but actually maybe maybe the key is that I'm super privileged and lucky that I've got such a supportive loving family because I feel like the worst thing that happened could happen is I'll end up like sort of back at mum and dad's <laughs> just isn't that bad <laughs> do you know what I mean I've got like such a good safety net and so that encouragement you know my mum is such a great encourager and uh, I think over growing up in that atmosphere has given me a security that also makes me feel like um, I've got a sort of a, a nice safety net there that allows me to take bigger risks yeah and then you can go out in the world and and express all these amazing ideas knowing that you know that yeah that that 
feeling of risk is not at the forefront. The feeling of curiosity and, and courage is, is bigger, which is amazing yeah. because it's what enables you to, to show up and do all these really fantastic creative art projects that, that are really going to help shape the world, hopefully in years to come. And they are already having an impact and um yeah i love what you do barney i really appreciate you coming on the podcast today to talk about everything all your ideas and your inspiration and your background it's it's been super helpful and really interesting to do this deep dive with you so i really appreciate it uh, likewise G- great to chat cheers everyone thank you for listening to this episode of the tenderness revolution I hope you come back for more because my aim with this podcast is to help us become more aware of these moments of kindness and compassion and how they shape our lives and enable us to feel more connected to the world around us.